Okay, so we're ready to get going. So it's December 14th, Monday. Uh, it's, could be our last meeting of December. I'm not sure. But anyway, could be, yeah. it's the meeting that we're having tonight at any rate. So uh, this is uh, the first meeting where we have a lot of substance related to the initial steps of design <coughs> development phase. So um, I don't see anybody here for the community input section. But as always, uh, even though we're kind of in, in a different phase of the project now, we still welcome community input. Um, and you can always email us at uh, schoolproject.hopkintonma.gov as well. Um, and we have some minutes and bills to review tonight. So if anyone has had a chance to look at those and prepare to make a motion or discuss, now is the time. So I'll move the minutes from November 12, 2015 as written. Seconds. Any discussion? Uh, only one. Yeah. On the, on the second page, that item five, inspector management risk, is spelled my name wrong. And that was my mother's benefit because she used to hate that when people figured out how to spell perfect. Sorry about that, Mike. <laughs> just fix that and we'll be Take out the A's. Yeah. We'll do. It's right in all the other places. Slip of the finger. Actually, it's not. My mom would love it. It's wrong. Oh, it's in the attendees of list. Oh. Yeah, see? There. <coughs> Other than that, I didn't have anything. Okay. <coughs> oh, there is again for section six. Yeah, so just do a global search and refresh okay. on that. Will do. Uh, for, uh, right. I didn't know it is right. I just reminded myself. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, so any other comments on the minutes? All right, so we're ready for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed or abstaining? No. One, two, three, four, five, six. Pam was the original motion. Who was the second? Just for record. Mike. Mike. Thanks, Mike. <coughs> ready for invoices? I'm ready. I move we accept uh, invoice number CPM 44 16 from Compass dated November 30th, 2015, in the amount of six. Thousand four hundred seventy-four dollars and sixty-three cents. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? I move we accept invoice number twelve zero one two from DRA dated December two two thousand fifteen, the amount of eighty-two thousand ninety dollars and fifty cents. Second. Seconded by Mike. Uh, any discussion? All in favor. Well, I, I just have, yeah, just one quick question. How is the design development being billed? Because I know the timeline is five months. Is it just sort of percentage over the course of the months, or? Yeah, yeah it's a percent complete. Um, DRA submitted a uh, cash flow is what they want to bill per month, and so it's in line with that. It may, it may not be the equal amounts per month. It's it, however right. much product in any of that month. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. It's based on progress. <clears throat> 10% or 10% through progress-wise, you're going 10% Correct. Any other discussion or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? <coughs> Is that all for the bills? Yep. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. That oh, okay. Yeah. <coughs> uh, Jeff, who, who was at the kickoff meeting? Can you sure, the, uh, the MSBA. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So uh, we had a meeting in Boston to kick off the next phase, which is the design development. Um, there were two reasons for that meeting. One, the MSBA actually does a transition of their internal management, so we're assigned a different project manager for the completion of design through uh, construction administration. Her and name the name is, is not Katie anymore, right? No, it's, it's, uh, Diana. it's, it's Diana. Diana. Okay. And uh, the second is just to set the tone and make sure everyone's on the same page as we move forward. So uh, from the town side, um, John Graziato, John Weaver, and Mike Shepard joined us. Uh, Tim and myself were present for Compass, and Judd and Jim Barrett were there for, from DRA. Uh, we had a very good meeting. We talked about uh, what the expectations are. Um, they, it was a back and forth on questions, and uh, we're, we're ready to move forward. There was no uh, concerns raised at that meeting, um, just more administrative type work. Um, so one of the open items that we need to resolve is getting the project scope and budget agreement signed and submitted. 
And so it was signed and submitted and sent to the state, and they came back with a couple of uh, requested items that were missing from the original submission. One is uh, exhibits A and I think H. Um, they didn't, we didn't submit enough original copies. So those are being recirculated around. I think they're in Kathy's hands now to get uh, signed by the uh, school committee chairman as well as some of the other people. And they also wanted this committee to officially <coughs> endorse. Is that the one we're talking Correct. about? Correct. Okay. Yep. So they'd like to take, have sure. this committee to take sure. a vote to uh, recommend signing the project scope and budget agreement. And then uh, Joe, as the committee's chairman, would be the uh, signatory authority on that document. We should just take a motion then. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's a little bit administrative overkill, right? Because we yeah. have submitted the certified town meeting vote and everything, so that we're <laughs> on board. Um, but we need to take a vote now. It's just a maybe motion to authorize you to sign it, and, right? And, and you know, this isn't what I'm signing. But whenever no, you give me the original, right. yeah. That's the document that came to me from from Norman and goes. Back to you, Jeff, but mm -hmm. there was something else. I see. Yeah. Motion authorized to yeah. 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 So a motion authorized Joe Markey to sign the project scope and budget agreement. So moved. Second. Right. Whew. Jim said it very eloquently. That was nice. All right. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? Okay. I'll get you that document uh, if I don't have it in the stack. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, one of the things, if I could just follow up with what Jeff was saying about the MSBA kickoff, one of the things that um, they <clears throat> they walk through the timeline. So uh, the the timeline for, for instance, the design development submission, and then the ninety percent construction document submission and then the final uh, 60 percent and then 90 percent and then um, so they but w within that there's a set period of time where they take and they'll take all of it and I think it about basically comes to about five weeks when it's all said and done where they review and comment and we incorporate certify we've incorporated so just to I only raise that because I think committees who don't aren't aware of that think well we'll just move through the design process and kind of it's a you know there's a bit of a stop takes a while so that's why we kind of want to be expeditious about how we get to that those points and just they're very clear about that they want their time frame to do that yeah I think they said they actually send it out to somebody to they do they have a they have a yeah they have a, 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 a sub house doctor and uh, contract you know so there's this yeah. fixed time it takes for that and they want to be sure that if we work on to make those those set points that yeah. we let them know so the guy doesn't get fouled up okay it's, play, it's, it's in our schedule and it's built into the schedule, but you know, we have a pretty, because of the desire to open up on the 2018 date, we have a pretty yeah. defined time to get to the start of early trade packages. Right. So. Okay. <coughs> and then uh, we have an update on the IG submission too, right, Tim? Yeah, so um, the Inspector General sent a letter out today authorizing us to. Um, procure the project under CM at risk, which is good since we've already started that process. Right. <laughs> um, the, um, so that's good news. That basically clears the only sort of regulatory hurdle on that. The, uh, in your packet is a list of the um, firms as of 1211 who have picked up the RFQ. Uh, some have responded that they're interested, which we asked for them, so we can expect to see, know who we're going to expect to see. Um, I think this list is going to change a little bit. I've had conversations with some of the CMs to, to, uh, that I think are going to be interested in it, so I think it's going to change a bit. Um, but it's a good crew of people. These are all if people who are familiar with the Boston building yeah, market. Yeah. You know, there's a good cross section of really some of the more prominent builders in the market, as well as some school builders um, who, who have got good school <coughs> background, you know, more traditionally Chapter 149 school construction, but they're quality, by and large, quality contractors. Um, and there's some mix of, you know, medium size, which you'd really want to be at, for this kind of a project, a pretty large company. So I think it's a pretty broad 
um, distribution of interest in the project. So those are those are due, I think, on Thursday. Yep. Yeah. And uh, we're going to meet the 23rd with the next week qualification committee and try to get a pre-qualified qualified group okay. uh, selected at that point. Tim, I, I was thinking about this today. If, if, um, if, for example, one of these, you know, Fred's construction company applies for the CM at risk, it's not on here, of course, um, and we select Fred, does that prevent Fred's firm from competing for the overall construction bid for the project? So, th so this is this, this CM, is separate. I know this CM at risk is basically um, the construction of the project. <coughs> so it's not a, they won't so manage it could the be construction. The same. It, well, basically, they're the builder. At this point, when they get selected, they'll be building. So oh, they'll put out the trade right, contracts. It, they essentially become the, the builder of the project. I guess. Um, so they're, they're not construction. Some, there's different terms people use and understandings on mm -hmm. that term, construction manager. In this case, it's the construction manager builder. Okay. GC. They, some people call it a CMGC. Um, yep. But that, so the, yeah, these will be the builder. All right. That's why All right. it's an important, it's a very important decision. But this is only step one of this. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay. No, thanks for clarifying. Uh, now I have one other final thing with you yeah, before sure, you move yeah, to the next topic. Yeah. Um, as part of the request for proposal, that's the next step in this, as we shortlist to say four, um, we're going to want to include in that the form of contract. Uh, and the CM contract is different than, a, than a, obviously a Chapter 149 contract, so um, we would like to discuss with you the possibility of engaging special counsel that are familiar with that kind of a contract. Because of the, con the great thing about CM at Risk, it provides a lot of information and power and, and accountability for, for, well, information and power for the community, the district, but accountability on the part of the CM. So the contract needs to be drafted in a little more thoughtful way about how the CM process will unfold, and it's good to have an attorney who knows that and has worked with it. Um, we've worked with, so uh, there are others, there are plenty, there are more than one, but we've worked with Bob Garrity from Garrity and Nisley on a number of projects. Bob was the associate counsel, I think, at DCAM for many years and then maybe 15 or 20 years ago started his own practice. He's a small firm. Uh, he's very reasonable in terms of his rate. And he does, um, I think, the best job of a CM at risk contract. Um, and you know, I so I would propose wanted to propose that as uh, the committee perhaps voting and authorizing the engagement of special counsel, um, and hopefully you will agree. But I'll take any questions on that. Okay. Any questions on that? I support it. It's yeah. Not a question. Uh, I agree with what Tim has said. Uh, it's a specific type of contract. I assume it's one of the standard. CM at risk ones modified. Is it AGC or AIA? Well, he, he or? uses his own form, but it's built off of sort of an AIA mm -hmm. primary basis. But it is his own form that he's developed over the years. It's actually, at one point, was a DCAM form. The DCAM contract now is no longer workable for most, many people feel, but, but the, this form kind of comes with some of that background. So if we were using not CM at risk, MSBA would have a canned contract, right? No, the no. MSBA doesn't Wait. develop canned. They don't. Unlike for us and the architects, they don't have okay. canned construction. So it's contracts. something we'd have to go. Yeah, up we'd with have that to anyway. do anyways. Okay. Yeah. Mike, is this? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm more than happy with that, especially based on your experience, and, and that's why we have you folks to make these kind of recommendations. Is this something we're going to have to spend more money for town council to look at after we? Well, I, I don't know what the rules are around because that would make it a little more awkward. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming, I don't know the rules around that, actually, in Hopkinton. Perhaps, uh, <clears throat> well, I, I'm just speaking for myself, perhaps you folks could contact town council and say, look, the committee is leaning towards having this guy draft the contract, and we'd be okay with that. Um, and then that would, if he said, yeah, that's fine, it seems reasonable to me, then he wouldn't be reviewing it, and we wouldn't be double dipping on the cost. Just my two cents. Yeah. Well, timing-wise, don't we have to have a copy yeah. of that contract in the next stage RFP? It does. I mean, yeah. we can add it in by addendum. It's not the end of the world if it's not ready on 
you know, January 1st or whenever we're sending it. When, I forget when those December are. December 29th. December 29th, but um, it would be nice to have it. <clears throat> Um, yeah, my, I, I, it seems like the right thing to do, right? I just don't know what the rules are, and John Mosier from Selectman <coughs> nor uh, Norman Camarillo are here yeah. right now. I don't get the sense you talked to them about it. I didn't have a chance to. So, um, would it be if if the if would it be appropriate for the board to make a motion subject, subject to their yeah. agreement or something? Or yeah, yeah, okay, subject to the town manager's agreement, I guess. Yeah, does that make sense to people? Okay. So. Sure. Anybody not think it's a good idea? Okay. Oh, I think it's a good idea. I just worry about the delay. Yeah. But right. if we can do it as an addendum, I can't imagine they're going to want to get into a contract type they have no experience with. But yeah, I mean, sometimes the the, the 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 difficulty can be sometimes people feel they do because they've done Chapter One Forty Nine, yeah. and uh, they do, you know there is a significantly different. Um, kind of delivery system. So, uh, yeah, but if you make the motion subject, yeah, I'll work. Yeah, it out. maybe the I'll motion is more like uh, unless there's some rule prohibiting us from doing that, you know, in town, you know. Okay. So if I feel so I'll make a contact with Norman if I question. feel like, um, you know, I need to engage you, Joe, to, to help with that. I'll. Do okay. That. Yeah. If you could touch base with him, and yeah. Norman says, by all means, we have to send it to town council. Yeah. Then. What's the name of the lawyer? It's it's Bob Garrity and his firm is Garrity and Nisley K N I S E L Y. I make a motion. Okay. Wait, wait, okay. So I just want to clarify, Joe, what you were saying. So so in terms of unless there's because there's there's two different things there. Unless there's a requirement that we go through town council. So are we saying that if there's not a requirement, we want to engage with the special council and not town council because. <coughs> Tim may talk to Norman and it may be well there's not a rule but we really want to and then what does he do in that case so are we saying that's that why as a I committee, said it the way I did okay yeah. I just want to make sure we were clear I agree with you I just want to make yeah. sure we're clear on that so yeah. absent a requirement we're mo making a motion to engage with separate council yeah that's okay. the feeling I was getting from people's conversations okay. so we'll see how the motion goes I guess see if that do you want to make that motion? No, go for it. All you. I make a motion based upon the OPM's uh, advice that we engage Garrity and Nisley to do the draft CM at risk contract based upon the approval by the town manager that it's not, that we're not required to use the town lawyer. Second. Oh, well, could, could I reword that? <laughs> or just to think about it for a second. If you just made the motion to retain special counsel subject to town subject to the town manager's approval and you know subject to just to say yeah, it, just like subject that, to yeah, it that right. way we'll we'll initiate that conversation first. Okay. And then and then like I, I said, if it might be something that I engage Joe to help so that we're not double dipping all the time. Right. Uh amend that to uh say um, uh, we make the recommendation to use Garrity and Nisley um, subject to the town manager's approval. approval. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? No. Okay. Anything else on that topic, no. Tim? So is that that's the full update on the construction manager selection process update, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, on Wednesday you had a, a meeting related to lead lead review, right? Mm -hmm. Lead uh, <coughs> lead elements in the project. So could sure. maybe get a review or update on how that went. Yeah. And, I guess and uh, Jim, there's a chair up here. I'd love for you to join us at the table if you if you can. <laughs> Yeah, so last week um, we had a kickoff meeting uh, for the LEED project, and what LEED is is leadership, energy, and efficient design. So that's the green building component of this project. Um, it also accounts for, uh, or will account for some percentage points on our reimbursement um, when we get to that stage of the project. So it's important that we engage that and, and meet our goals. Um, so one of the first steps there is the design team needs to organize and have a kickoff meeting of both the design team members as well as uh, team leadership from the town and the school department to talk about which components of that program we'd like to pursue. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Judd. Sure. 
Um, in your meeting packet was, uh, Fred Chief, I have copies of it here if people would like it. But I'll take one. Basically, a uh, more definitive. Let me just take one pass around. On the screen here, what, what I have is the, the, a revised lead checklist. I don't know if you remember, we had to provide one of these as part of all of our submission, uh, submissions to the MSBA. Uh, the last one that we had during our preferred schematic, we were targeting approximately uh, 51 points based on our meeting um, that we had on, on, on Wednesday. We're now um, targeting 56 points. Um, but there's also probably a good four to six others that we feel are still in the questionable column that we can look at um, as the design um, uh, develops further. Uh, the big thing to remember here is we want to have at least 50. That's what we would need to achieve uh, silver certification. And as Jeff has indicated, for silver certification through the MSBA, we, re we would receive, the town would receive two additional reimbursement points. Um, and that's... Um, that's how we present it to the MSBA, and I believe that the, those numbers are in the calculations that they've provided as your maximum um, uh, reimbursement. So right now, we're, as I said, we're targeting 56 that we feel comfortably that we can make. Uh, that's an increase of five. Uh, what we did at the meeting on Wednesday is went through every item, had a discussion on it. Some were a little bit more discussions than others. Um, some of them are fairly easy. Um, a couple of the, I, I would say the things or the modifications that we've made from the submittal um, under the location and transportation section, which is the first, um, on, on the first sheet is the first section. We have removed or have taken the point under reduced parking footprint, which we were claiming originally, and we've moved that to the questionable column. Um, based on the parking counts that we have now and what the school will require, we're probably not going to meet that requirement. Um, and we also, there were a couple of others that we had kind of gone back and forth on, but there were several other newer ones that we've looked at that we've been able to move from the questionable column into the, uh, into the targeted yes column. Um, so this is the revised, this is revised based on the meeting that we had on Wednesday. We will have another one of these meetings at the end of design development, right at the beginning of the construction documents, after we've had a chance to review the cost estimates, because there's a couple like I said, that we were on the fence on that we want to see where the pricing set comes in to determine whether we want to go for those or not. And again, we'll come back to the committee on, on those items that are going to have an impact on cost as to, as to where we want to go. But we think going in, there's going to be, there's two submissions that we'll make to lead. The first one is at the end of design, we'll make a design submission. And we're probably going to want to be at 60 when we make that submission because we're not going to hit everyone we want. And as the design gets along, ones that we thought we could get, we're going to find we can't. Oh. So when we submit 60, they'll probably approve us at 57. And then when we submit again at the end of the construction, there'll probably be two or three more that drop out, but we do want to make sure we stay at 50 or above. So we think being at 10, 10 above that is a good safe target for us to be at. Well, I mean, the range is 50 to 59, so we should be right. 10 above the minimum or 10 above well, the maximum? Well, we right. need at least 50, so that's yeah. what we would need. If we fell to 49, uh, we, right. it would, the project would just end up being certified right. and it wouldn't be silver. So we want to make sure we're at least 50. So that's why we're saying right now what I'd like to, when we make the design submission, I'd like to be at 60. <clears throat> if we achieved 60, mm -hmm. yeah, which is not likely the mm -hmm. scenario you're painting, um, would that put us into the higher level? It, 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 I believe it would. I believe you would get to gold if you get to 60, um, but that's not going right. to generate any additional reimbursements okay. from the MSB. That was the next right. 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 Budgeting is yep. based on silver, so our cost budgets are based on silver, not right. gold does have usually a premium. But right. we couldn't get more from the state. Right. No. Especially not now since they won't change anything. <laughs> no, right. Target? As you know, upward. Yeah. So it's just, it'll take it down. They're, they're pretty only, clear on that. Right. They'll go yeah. down, they won't go up. Judd, can you just give, make sure we're all on the same page? Yeah. Can you just help us read this so that the column headings T, Y, oh, yes. question mark, uh, no? I'm sorry. So T yeah. is the total number of points that are available. Total. Okay. So that's how many yeah. that, that, that are, are in there. Anything on the yes are ones that we feel comfortable we can achieve. Okay. Anything in the questionable ones are still ones that. We could go after, 
Um, but there's probably a premium associated with going after them. It could be a premium in cost, or it could even be a premium of space in the building that we would need to try to account for. So those are the ones you do that cost analysis Correct. on? Okay. Correct. There, there was, I would say, four to six that we kind of had some pretty lively discussions yeah. on at the meeting on Wednesday. I see. And we kind of said, let's keep them in the questionable one, but we can go back and, 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 and revisit those. There's yeah. also a couple that... Right now, just because we haven't done the calculations, we, we haven't moved them to the yes column. But we feel that e even though we're carrying them as question marks, that once we do the calculations for them, we can probably, you know, get a, another point here or another point there. So, uh, not wanting to rehash the meeting. Exactly, yeah. Or, or maybe we do. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll be a little rehash the meeting happen on Wednesday, but, but I'm curious. I mean, we're at 56 in the yes column, and you're yeah. saying we want to push to get to 60. So I'm curious about where you think the levers are that those additional four could come from. Okay, so um, first of all, there's some innovation points that we think we can probably um, go for. Um, there were a couple interesting ones that we talked about at the meetings the other, the other day. One, I know Mike had asked about um, in town there's a recycling center that does full kind of recycling. If we could um, have the CM use that recycling center and be able to claim that anything that we recycled, we had a very limited um, trip that it had to make to get to there, that that could be looked at as a favorable um, okay, points for that. Right. So there's a couple of those that we've talked about. I think Rain Garden was another one that... Educational Rain Gardens right. are used a lot for innovation points, and demonstrating how the water comes from the roof and soaks into the ground. Okay. With some um, signage that goes along with it. Okay. But, yeah, there's, there's, sorry, like there's, uh, so, it's, so I'm reading it then that there's 41 potential additional points yeah that you're looking yeah. at too, yeah but I would say uh, yeah. of some of those some of them would be costly right and then are there some that uh, are in the yes column that you're, you're saying there's some in the yes column that could be trade-off for some in the question mark column no I right. think the ones that are in the yes column we feel pretty confident on now as the design develops there may be things that fall out from that meaning we're targeting one now, but when we get to design development, we find that we're over budget on a certain item and we say, you know what, trying to achieve that point is not great. So then we'll look at some of the ones that we had in the, in the questionable column. Okay. So when I say we have 56, those are ones right now, as of the meeting that we went through, we felt pretty comfortable we can achieve. Okay. But we I mean, definitely but think there's another six or eight that are there that, yes, we can do as well. Yeah. And when you say it's an increase from before, so during the schematic phase, <clears throat> you did some cost estimation, and it was based on an assumption of which of these mm. you were looking at? No, there may have been some costs that we did on some of them, but <laughs> primarily what I asked the consultants to give me was which ones they feel, one, they can easily incorporate in the project without any significant upticks in cost, in things that they would typically do in their typical design. I mean, there's a lot of items here that we just normally do, and we probably would never do a project, you know, that way again. That's just that's just the nature of, of doing, you know, that, buildings. Now. That's good to know how, how we got to the starting point. That's probably a good starting point, but um, then uh, I'm hoping that on Wednesday you got Hopkinton-specific oh, yeah. feedback, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, Kathy was there, Lauren was there, um, John Moser John was there, um, Mike Shepard was there, and Al Rogers was there. So there was a lot of um, discussions back and forth. There was a lot of talk on some of the energy numbers, right. um, some metering that we're looking at. It was one of the ones that became a, a kind of a topic on in terms of some advanced electrical metering, which yeah. we can do, but that may have some additional wiring costs. And that's one of the ones we we'll probably look at targeting. Um, where the costs come in the design development set. And where does that, which category is that? Um, that's most likely under the energy. I think it's on the third here. page. Advanced energy metering. Okay. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Top, top of, of the page. Right. And what about like a indoor air quality? Because that was one that we got questions on prior to town meeting and we oh, made some yeah. strong statements about the indoor air quality so we yeah I would follow through that oh yeah no I I would say if you go and look there's um uh, indoor um, is a couple under on the fourth page there's some minimum enhanced indoor air quality strategies um, 
There's one that we're targeting. There's another one that we have in the question comment. Um, and then also under indoor air quality assessment, that's some testing that you can do. Basically, there's a baseline study that you can do, yeah. and then you can go in after a certain period of time and do some testing on it to determine whether you've hit certain goals that you want or not. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, most of those are checked, okay. okay. <coughs> Great. Uh, and I, I don't want to rehash the whole meeting. I'm sorry I wasn't able to make it. Uh, but I do have a uh, question too about like uh, water protection, the groundwater, uh, wastewater run, run, you know, stormwater runoff. Mm -hmm. uh, given the site location, your wetlands and all that. So are we have we checked the boxes off on that one as well? For let's see, Is that be site sustainable sites or yeah, rain, rainwater, yeah rainwater management, management. credit for. You, it looks like that's one you're going to look into a little more that wasn't on the initial list. Right. Correct. And I'm Chelsea Christensen from Niche Engineering, the okay. civil engineer. Um, we still need to do a lot of calculations for that based on the site design. It's going to be difficult to achieve given the soils on the site, but we will have a lot of spread out um, infiltration strategies to try <coughs> to achieve that and a lot of um, like water quality swales and low impact design techniques that we will try to achieve that but okay. given the infiltration rate of the soil it may be very difficult so until we get through the calculations we won't really know okay yeah did you have other questions I, uh, just yeah. an observation as, as, as I was sitting through this thing it, it occurred to me that the whole lead process is, isn't designed specifically for schools it's, it's designed for all commercial buildings so I found that there were some things in there that wouldn't fit in the school anyway, and we weren't going to get those points, you know, because of different things that the commercial sector does that we don't do. Um, you know, up to this point, we've been thinking all about the schools, and you know, the kind of thing kind of revolves around us. Well, this really doesn't. This revolves around all commercial buildings that want to be energy efficient, and, mm -hmm. and uh, so it, it, it's smart to keep that in mind. There are some things that in a school setting, for instance, we talked about the parking. You know, a normal business, people go to work in the morning and park their car. We get extra points if we put everything under a roof, you know, parking garage like the EMC yeah. does. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for a school where people come, the teachers are the only ones that stay, the parents come, drop off the kids, pick them up. We have to have parking for all those people. So our parking footprint is bigger than it would be otherwise. Um, we have to have, you know, the buses take up a lot of space. and, and you know, so are, there are some things that in a school setting are, are less, I guess, achievable than they would be at a commercial setting. We have more control. And, uh, but I, it was, I was halfway through the thing on Wednesday when it occurred to me that we couldn't fit some of this stuff. If, I see, yeah. Jim, if, if I can, Joe, yes, through you, you uh, to that point. Previously, um, MSBA did allow for uh, what was Mass Chips as a program and LEED. There were two. Uh, chips program uh, was high performance schools and it was specific to schools. Um, MSBA has decided that LEED, lead only will be acknowledged going forward. And, and I, I do agree with you as a result. There are certain categories that are non starters. The program is robust and does allow for a wide category of areas for us to explore so we feel pretty confident that we can help guide you there and that the outcomes are actually meaningful so um, I, I do think even though it's not specifically geared to a school project it is something that does yield uh, good results long term okay uh, I have one other th thank you Jim uh, one other question I have so when we opt not to do certain things it doesn't mean that we're not going to do it at all it just means we so for example there's one here to reduce indoor water consumption we may not go for all seven points but it doesn't mean we're not going to be yes. careful to manage indoor water consumption correct so right? on that item in particular to hit seven points we would have to reduce what they do is there's a baseline calculation that gets done for all of the um, water fixtures you'd have your toilets your sinks your urinals and there's a baseline and then you know we would typically specify a, a low flow fixture and what we would do is a comparison saying well if we had all the baseline here's how much we would use here's our design here's how much we use and here's the delta 
right? What's going to be a little difficult on this project is we have a lot of toilets because there's a toilet in each individual classroom, especially at the kindergarten level. It's not even a urinal. It's a water closet. So to try to get to those upper numbers <coughs> is going to be difficult for us. We've targeted that we think we can get to, I think, a 30% reduction. At a minimum, what we're required to do is be at a 20%. That's what the, the prerequisite is. We think we can get two more, which gets us to the 30%. 35 is going to be, it's going to be a little difficult. If we had more urinals and we could go to, say, like a, you know, a, a waterless urinal, that's where you can get to that level. So, yes, we're going to try our hardest. We're going to do some calculations. Um, we're going to use low flow fixtures everywhere we can. We're going to use reducers on sinks, which also kind of help minimize the amount of water that comes through there. But getting to some of those numbers is just going to be a little difficult for us. Okay. But, okay, that's good. So we're, we're not trying to just stay at a minimum. If we happen to find that it's cost effective to do things that gain us additional points, we're not trying to stay no. as close to 60. Mm -hmm. If you have no. to 65 with no added cost, we would do it, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely, right. yeah. yeah. Okay. Joe, can I ask one yes. more question? So as we think about moving forward, and you mentioned that um, some of these somewhat still question mark points will come back with some more more of an assessment of what the cost would be. Mm -hmm. So will we be doing, when we think about the cost, will we also be able to get some visibility into what potential maintenance savings we would have? Yeah. So like the, I'm thinking, although it's in the yes column, the advanced energy metering just sort of pop for me because that's something where there may <coughs> be an upfront cost, but from a, an actual building operational management perspective, we may end up saving more over time mm -hmm. for doing it that would more than offset the cost outlay. So will we be able to get that information? I know Mr. Rogers is involved in the conversations, which is good from that perspective too. But Yeah, and I think also, you know, we're going to have um, an energy model done for the building, which is going to talk about <coughs> what, what the building is going to use from an energy standpoint. And that can be compared to what the baseline building would as well. So you'll get some some understandings for what that is. And we have a consultant on our team who will be doing that, working directly with the mechanical and the electrical engineer to understand what all the loads are that are going into the building and, and you know, be looking at the, the amount of insulation we have on the roof and what types of window systems we have for, for all of those things to come up with what the energy modeling is. And that'll help. There'll be other things too, I would assume, that yes, we'll be able to say, you know, on this one, um, yeah, maybe there's a little bit more upfront cost to put some of these meters in, but in the long run, there's a payback for it, and our, our engineers should hopefully be able to give us those, those okay. numbers. Great. Okay. Yeah, another example. That was a good one, John. And another one would be the water reduction, right? Because mm -hmm. you mentioned there's lots of toilet fixtures in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be expensive to upgrade them all to low flow or whatever is required. Right. On the other hand, you'd be saving a lot of water given the number of mm -hmm. fixtures you have. So it would be important to have the operational benefit on hand also. At the same time, we have the added cost. It might be an added cost up front, but return enough savings over time that it is well worth it within the overall project budget. Yeah, I mean, that's where we're <laughs> stuck with. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What, do we need any action? And it sounds like the action out of Wednesday's meeting was to have a follow-up meeting with additional data to review and continue that discussion. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the other thing that, that, that will happen is um, we will do a um, what they call a, um, a baseline energy model. And I'm not sure whether that's going to end up being a throwaway model that they'll do just to talk about, try to get an understanding of where we think from an energy standpoint we are. Uh, in talking with our consultant, we think the building footprint's pretty well developed. I'm not really sure where we're going to be changing that very much. So we may be able to, you know, build upon that model instead of throwing it away, but we'll start to build that right now. And that's one of the things we'll want to look at at the next meeting, right, say at the beginning of uh, construction documents and a DD when we've had a chance to look at the estimates and then come back at this and, and re-look at the strategies again. Okay. And when this goes for a building permit, the new code will be in place, so the new energy code will be mm -hmm. the baseline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else that we should to do then for you? I guess we'll just continue that discussion at, at, uh, to be scheduled and posted meeting. OK, 
okay with that, Kathy? Okay. okay. Anything else you want to provide no, from that I meeting? Like okay. it? No, no, no. <laughs> I just want to make sure no. I didn't uh, neglect to get your feedback. Thank you. All right, Mike. Uh, uh, no, uh, this is probably the appropriate time to say it. Uh, part of the deal is the MSBA provided us a commissioning agent, and um, his job was to make sure that when the school is turned over, that people have the manuals, you know, operate the equipment, the, the, the HVAC system is functioning. It, at its maximum Balanced efficiency, yeah. or its designed efficiency. Um, so there's, there's, you know, and, and since this guy actually, I suppose we're paying for him, but the MSBA hired him, and he was there mm -hmm. as well. And um, there was a big discussion about one of the last items over <coughs> commissioning and, and whether or not <coughs> we hire somebody to come back in a year and check and make sure that the systems were operating as you know, and, and this is the one that John Mosher was yeah. big on. Um, and, and the fellow said, yeah, but we, we don't do that. Um, you, you know, that'll come with some additional cost. And there may be additional points available for that as we are going through that yeah. section. So that was one of those things where we have to weigh whether the cost of doing that is outweighed by the, 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 uh, the, uh, you know, actually, actually doing it. Whether the efficiencies we've gained are going to be, it, it's great to say that I bought a new Toyota, I'm going to bring it back in six months, and the Toyota guy will check it and make sure it's operating. Um, once this school is turned over and the commissioning guy does his thing, we don't know what the hell happens to the building after that. And well, he does, that, he does come back in 10 months. Well, no, no. But what I'm saying, five years down the road. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so the building that we designed to operate this efficiency gets, gets tweaked by the little minions that work in there and saying, yeah, maybe, you know, 68 was great, but 70 is better. And, and at the end, we don't really end up with the building we designed. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> there was some process where a, a person would come back. You'd have to pay for this. Mm -hmm. And he'd verify that actually the building is working the way it was designed some period after it was turned over to us. Uh, but the feeling in the room was that comes at a relatively substantial cost, and, and we, nobody knew the cost at that time, other than the fact that it was going to be more than what we paid for. Um, and I mentioned to John that, it, you know, uh, John Mosher was a big advocate for this, and I said, well, perhaps that was something that the, the Board of Selectmen should look at and do it for all their buildings, because, you know, because you know, the Hopkins School may be wasting way more energy than it was designed to, and sure we'd like, as a taxpayer, to know about that. So it might be something they do, um, you know, through their buildings or, or from a bigger picture. Um, but there was a lot of discussion over that, and uh, I hope I kind of focused on what it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. just to yeah. clarify, so the, the MSBA, when they sign their commissioning agent, um, which acts on your behalf, yeah. They'll evaluate the building at completion. They'll make sure it's all checked and balanced and all the systems are operating. Yeah. The school will then take possession of the building. They'll go through an academic calendar year and then about 10 months from substantial completion, they'll come back and do a verification, both looking at the systems and then chatting with Al and his team, making sure what works and doesn't work and we can focus in on that. What Mike's describing is more of a continuous approach where yeah. a couple times a year, a sub-consultant hired by the town would evaluate the trending of the actual school, and that could continue on for an in, any number of years, yeah. which is why we couldn't quantify that cost at that time if it was a two-year program, a five-year, or a seven-year program, or whether it was done at multiple schools and you get an efficient buy from, uh, you know, in terms of the size of a contract. Yeah, you, you may recall that uh, it was probably seven or eight years ago now we talked about hiring an energy management firm to actually take over this portion of all the buildings, mm -hmm. not just the school building. Yeah. From a town perspective, right, or business. makes sense to me. Yeah, um, and we got all kinds of proposals, and um, it, it was never acted on. But I think that's more the way, you know, you know, yeah, the school will be out of the box, will be state of the art, energy efficient, and it will probably run that way for the next twenty years. Um, but it, you know, this isn't going to be the big energy waster, as far as I can see. It's going to be the older Amongst, schools yeah. and the older, you know, town buildings, the town hall, etc. And um, you know, makes sense, Mike. There was yeah, a lot of discussion right. around that. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. want to make sure this is equipped with all of the, the best monitoring and management systems, but uh, uh, 
making sure that over time we continue to get the return out of those systems yeah. seems like uh, it is kind of something we want to do as a town across all our buildings maybe in the purview of the permanent building committee or the sustainable yeah. green committee under the board of selectmen yeah, yeah. That could be rather cool. than us taking it out of our our project cost yeah <laughs> right yeah exactly yeah Okay, so what, what, what we'll want to review the numbers on that. And I, I just want to encourage DRA and Mitch and any other consultants preparing for those meetings to come with all the, all the cost estimates that we anticipate would come up in discussion so that we don't have to keep going back. Mm -hmm. We want those meetings to be, we, we, we're presuming you're bringing in the experts, right, who have all that at the tip of their fingers, not have to go back and meet again and review data that maybe should have been there at the meeting in the first place. Okay. Uh, anything else on that? Site and utility review discussion. So, uh, um, as Chelsea and Chad mentioned, they'll they'll do a, the site presentation here and give you guys an update on that. And okay. David as well. Sure, David. You want to start with site? Sure. Uh, good evening, David Warner with Warner Larson Landscape Architects. Uh, I believe we also have a few images after this yep, as well, we do. right? Yep. Um, well, I'll start with the, um, the plan. <coughs> um, now, this plan looks very similar to what you saw at the end of uh, schematic design. We just wanted to recap where we are and where we're moving forward. Um, and I have some images of what various types of potential materials and um, the character of some of these spaces we're looking at. Uh, to be able to get some preliminary uh, feedback from you and show you the direction that we'd like to go in. Um, but this is a um, school in the woods um, type of uh, location here. We, we know that it's a beautiful site. It's directly adjacent to EMC Park and we want to take full advantage of um, its natural beauty and character um, to the extent that we can. Um, the um, subtle changes that we've made to this plan are, are, are very subtle, but um, with the play lawn in the back, we've kind of squared that off a little bit, and the uh, fire lane uh, and bike path pedestrian route to EMC Park is something that um, we're looking at bringing that a little bit closer to the east easterly property line. Um, will the camera get me if I stand up there and point at the screen? I know I can't use a laser pointer on a on this, or can I just describe it in words? You can walk up there. Okay. It's better for us. I yes, mean, I'm uh, a more Mike will run out and anyway. tell us if there's a technical problem. So, um, yes, uh, you've got the slope over here and the community garden, and off of, out of the view here is the little skate spot. We're thinking that it's a, probably a better alignment to bring the um, this pathway along the side so it doesn't interrupt the contiguous nature of that existing space. Uh, where the community garden is adjacent mm -hmm. to this walking path, the sledding hill comes down to the edge of the play area. And, uh, and so we'll make this connection coming right along the tree line here and then connecting in at the end of the parking lot that's just off the screen. Um, so that is uh, one change that we're moving in direction. This would, pathway would be developed um, with uh, security lighting so that people who are parking here for yeah. evening events yeah. or yeah. after yeah. hours can uh, have a safe walking pathway um, into the school. We're also thinking about the connection of this as a bike path that would connect through and ultimately down to the other town properties, the former Tadara property to the south. Um, that would come to the east side of the school along this bus loop driveway here. But as um, Chelsea pointed out a little bit about the uh, stormwater management, I'll also indicate that we've got these um, in the main two parking lots here, we've opened up a, um, a green uh, planted area, which can be a vegetated swale. Stormwater can be flowing off the, this upper parking lot here and here, and then flowing through that vegetated swale is the first step in the process of water quality and controlling a little bit of the rate of runoff, um, and ultimately going into a, uh, a bioretention area here, here, and along this side. One of the other things that we'd like to do is take advantage of this green space here as a visual buffer, a subtle visual buffer as you're coming in to the site so that you're uh, seeing over the empty, mo mostly empty parking lot during the day, right? It's, this is, parking lot's gonna be largely used for parents coming to pick up their children in the afternoon. Um, by concentrating first the low point that we need for the stormwater runoff, 
near the parking lot, but just a subtle raised lawn area so that uh, you're looking across the space to the school. Um, it's just a subtle difference in grade change there can make a, a significant difference in terms of uh, what you see, your first impressions driving in here, seeing the building with the subtle green in front of you versus uh, a large parking lot. Right. Uh, one other element that we've, we've started to indicate uh, on the plan is the potential for um, that identity signage as you come in, turning into the site, um, welcoming you to the new school, that um, whatever the school becomes named, this would be probably uh, one of the locations somewhere along here. Your first impression, before you have the full view of the school, you see that identity, um, and then turn and come around the corner here, you can see the full view of the school. Of course, there would be signage here, but it uh, <coughs> like Hayden Road Street as you approach. Uh, instructional signage, directional, so turning into the site. But this, I think, is a good location somewhere in this vicinity to uh, put that identity signage. The other images I'm going to show you will identify the potential character that we're thinking about for these entry clauses. Um, some for the, uh, the younger children's play area and the older children's play area and how we can help make this emergency access requirement disappear, in integrated within the play environment and it doesn't look like you have this fire lane circumnavigating the, uh, the school. So maybe we can go on to some of those images. So um, with this entry plaza, what I'd like to um, you to focus on is more about the, not so much the style, um, but more about the combination of materials. So we have um, unit pavers as an embellished uh, paving type right at the school entry, and uh, raised areas that can allow for some seating contiguous to the drop-off area that also protect landscape spaces so we don't have landscape spaces that are flush with the paving that are going to be trampled by people walking to and from school. And, and mixed material, so we have the warmth potentially of wood along with um, you know, the durable you know, pavers which are probably going to be in the precast concrete category. Um, how we transition between the edge of the developed area, we have a lot of places on the site that are program related, the parking, the play areas, but then between those edges and the natural environment, it's very important to heal that edge. We have slopes that are going to be fill slopes and some that are going to be excavated. These are a couple of examples of projects that our, our firm has done. Um, Medway High School, where it was a greenfield site, the area had to be cleared, but and uh, Chelsea and I worked on this project together, actually. This is showing um, ball fields up above, and then the fill slope. This would happen to be the, uh, the retention basin that was part of uh, bioretention, also stormwater control. And then there were a lot of boulders <coughs> on the site that we were able to save, put them to the edge. It, it actually protected the fields from the ATVs and the motorbikes in the woods that uh, would like to come out and joy ride on those fields. Uh, and then we came back and replanted that slope with these little uh, wood uh, woody saplings to help re restart the forest edge so that would regrow back in. And this is out of Southbridge. Um, and so basically having large meadow areas that could, if you want to keep it more of a, a beautiful meadow and a view across to the school that could be cut once a, be once a year, there's very little maintenance requirement associated with it. And this was the, uh, the first impression as you come up to that school um, and the community does continue to mow that once a year. So um, the play environment, um, there's um, a couple of different examples in here that I know specifically about. This is a, an outdoor um, classroom space, kind of a work table in a natural setting that we designed in, uh, in Brighton, actually, for the Edison School. And uh, using some of the natural materials of stumps, oftentimes like a black locust that doesn't decompose very quickly, or a northern white cedar. Um, this is actually up at the Winthrop School in Ipswich. We saw that uh, not too long ago during a walkthrough there and uh, really um, like the simplicity of how they just put these uh, wood cedar posts embedded in the ground in a couple of arcs, um, a couple of posts here so that it can serve as a, an outdoor classroom gathering space. Um, and then um, the idea of possible um, colorful movable furniture and perhaps even incorporating slate or some sort of a outdoor whiteboard in those um, little sinuses or those uh, recesses uh, between the classrooms where you have the breakout space inside the building that you can take outside. Um, you know, I love the idea of natural slate because 
use traditional chalk, you can wash away in the rain, mm. but there are whiteboards that are made for the outdoor environment as well. And uh, to take the movable furniture a step further, these are indoor-outdoor soft, cushy blocks that are lightweight, kids can move them around. Um, they're actually uh, functional from a seating standpoint, but they're also fun as manipulatives in a, in a play environment for this age of, of children. Um, they can be brought inside at night so that they're not, you know, a theft issue. Uh, but they can be taken out in the daytime, and if they get rained on, then it doesn't matter. You know, they're resilient that way. Um, and thinking about the, the space between the, um, the breakout space inside right. the building in the sections of the classrooms and, and what's outside, um, you know, we haven't really even gotten into the point of talking about all the different materials. But thinking about how those materials that might be used on the floor inside the building can be brought outside and make that space a little bit more seamless. And so when the weather's nice, the teachers could, what they plan to do inside, could just take a step right outside and do, uh, have that same type of activity. Um, and then as far as play, this uh, image down here at the bottom is kind of what we're thinking about in terms of making that fire lane disappear, where the hardscape could be um, coated you know, with the same type of coating system that you use at basketball courts or tennis courts, and then lively graphics um, that are unique to Hopkinton or you know, specific games or activities that the children uh, with instructors could perhaps uh, learn, play. Um, th this up here is <coughs> thinking about the same type of character I showed you for the uh, ideas on the entry plaza, taking that same idea to the back you know, in terms of the play area where you have the cafeteria and the space outside, mixing materials, um, the warmth of wood, and surfacing back there, which we are currently budgeting for unit pavers. Um, and I know um, this is the realm of the architect, but we have um, areas where you're showing right now some, um, some pergola type structure or canopy that uh, can be associated with um, the various entryways and entry points how those all work together. We're thinking about the materials on the building, the canopy, and the landscape as being as though they were drawn by one hand and we're working together with the RA so they all come together. Um, the, uh, the play environment, it's, it's a little bit um, early to be showing you play equipment because I know in January there's going to be a subcommittee meeting which will be working closely with a select group of people who are talking about specific playground equipment and we're uh, very excited about getting involved at that level of detail. One of the things that this image shows is um, in addition to specific playground equipment and uh, that the environment itself, you know, we're thinking can be recreated using a lot of natural materials, using the stones that exist on the site um, with natural wood and actually landform to help create the, the play environment. Yeah. So pavement markings um, and just painted games. This is the Higginson Lewis schoolyard in, uh, in Roxbury that um, we ended up uh, doing the whole playground design for, but showing how, and this is not what we're proposing for Hopkinton, other than the type, the approach and the type of materials and that you can have a lot of games in a relatively small space <laughs> and through organized uh, activities, uh, they actually had a a specific program at the school where um, a group outside of the school community would come there after school and work with the children to uh, coach them on these various games. Some of them are traditional, you know, hopscotch, and this is a variation on hopscotch, but this is the a numbers game, which is both fun from a physical standpoint and, um, and mathematical, so it's a learning op uh, opportunity as well. The little track that goes all the way around half court basketball and has all the measure lines in both uh, English and metric. So there's an opportunity for kids as they're running around the track to know how many, um, you know, how many uh, feet they ran or how many um, how many meters they ran, uh, and whether you know we can incorporate the the alphabet. There's a, it's really limit, limitless in terms of the types of things that we can do. But I think pavement markings are a relatively inexpensive way to enliven the space outside. And uh, we'd like to make sure that that space is not used uh, frequently by vehicles. I know the, the police would like to have access through there and uh, to be able to, to see the back of the school. So these are um, pavement markings that can withstand light traffic, but not, uh, not heavy traffic. How about weathering? Yes. 
Yeah, the um, pavement marking is just like a basketball or tennis court. You know, you're looking at uh, a cycle of about five to seven years recoding that. It's an acrylic surfacing, and it's not terribly expensive if you're doing that. At other times, when you're uh, doing courts in town, that might be a good way to approach that maintenance cycle. Oh, and then um, those those um, sections between the the classrooms that are recessed in adjacent to the breakout space, we know that that character, how those spaces relate to um, the driveway and the drop-off area. And there are concerns about safety and separation, but we also want to make sure that the, um, they don't feel caged in with tall fences. And we're thinking that um, you know, there's a lot of stone on the site, nice field stone wall, walls that exist there. They happen to be more larger, rounded rubble stone and it might be difficult to do um, more squared off walls. <laughs> but I think that even if we were able to reuse 20, 25% of those stones for this, the linear footage of these sections is not that great. Uh, it, would be, it would be really wonderful to be able to rebuild uh, some of those walls into a, uh, some that reflected the character of this site. And uh, we didn't have to import too many materials for that. Another idea, which is a bit more contemporary, and it is actually something that uh, is, is sort of catching on in terms of uh, a style these days, but um, gabions, they're metal baskets that are that you can fill with almost anything, but uh, filled with stone. They, they sort of evolved from more of an engineering solution to uh, retaining wall uh, substitutions to uh, something that is of a landscape aesthetic that is um, fitting into more contemporary design. Simply showing that, uh, I think, the indicate that we can still reuse materials that are on the site uh, in ways like this. Um, maybe it's not the style or character you want to see in Hopkinton, but it's when we can compare two different solutions here to the same problem and show you the options, it's, um, it's how we can solicit feedback. So um, this is really just intended to show you uh, a range of ideas that we're thinking about. And if you have any strong opinions now, I'm, I'd love to hear them, but otherwise, um, you know, we'll be uh, taking this forward into the design development phase uh, with the input and feedback from your subcommittee process. Okay. Good. Any any feedback, comments, reactions? Mike? Uh, the, the very first one regarding the, the, the way in from EMC Park. I, I would like to see us develop this nice trail system around the edges as you described and have people walk through the play area just to get to the school because most people will take the short assistance mm -hmm. no matter what you do for a trail. But more importantly, before we go designing yeah. trails on other people's property, you might want to sit down with the Parks and Rec department and find out what, what would be most suitable for them. Yeah, I, I would one say. Of the, one, of the key, one of the key elements in this play area yeah. is a pile of dirt. And, and from my perspective, that pile of dirt could really be anywhere, and it could be done with an excavator in five minutes. This, uh, one, this one here. Yeah, that's, the pile, that's where the kids all go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> so if, 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 it, if it meant making this trail through the, through the park shorter, they're more, more efficient, less lighting, more direct access to the school for people dropping off their kids and delivering them in the morning, I would, I would think we'd want to go that way. But most importantly, we, we want to work cooperatively with the Parks and Rec Department and not do something that doesn't work into their plan. So right. I would suggest you pretty pretty early on you sit down with them and find out what their um, their druthers are in terms of what we do with their space. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. So um, we need to engage. They, the selectmen have pointed a multi-site uh, plan committee that deals with EMC Park any part of this property we're not using through Tadaro uh, on the other side. So um, we need, uh, you know, if, if you give me the dates and deadlines, I can help you notify them that we need their input by such and such a date, which is going to be a lot sooner than they expect, you know. But we, uh, at, at a minimum, we need to do things in a way that um, doesn't preclude options that they may be wanting to consider, yeah, right? Exactly. Uh, but it's a definite fact that we won't be able to go too far uh, with any definite plans outside our property lines without their involvement. Joe, have they started to meet formally yet since the appointment? I, I, don't, I don't think, think so. I think I had just heard that they had increased the number 
of people they wanted. Well, I met somebody who said they were appointed, so I assume everybody was. I don't think the selectmen yeah. have done their side of it. Okay. I, I was just going to add yeah. to the Upper Charles yeah. Trails Commission, which I think operates outside of Parks and Rec. Yeah. Do they? Would that yes. be another group? Yeah, so I, Mike was talking about Parks and Rec, uh, and then there's the Upper Charles <coughs> Trail Committee, and then there's the Multi-Site Planning Committee, right. which I was referring to, which oh. I think has representatives from both of those. I see. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so definitely we need to get uh, involved with the right groups to um, advance this. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so the action there is, Jeff, if you can give me the dates and, and Things we I can send an email yeah, or letter. Yeah, I'll get with Judd okay. and uh, Dave, and we'll figure out what's the okay. most appropriate time within the next you know sixty days to right. with them. Probably, is that okay? Sixty days. Oh, yeah. Sooner the better, as far as I'm concerned. But the yeah, holidays. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think we could target something early in January after the after the holidays. Yeah. Yeah, and again, it might be, we, we don't even know the state of this, this committee yet, so uh, it might be a fact of they're not ready to engage and we've got to move forward. Right, so we may just choose to go to the Parks and Recs Direct if, if that yeah. committee hasn't got legs yet. Okay, uh, what else? You know, the, other, the, the other part, um, getting back to the Parks and Rec, is, is I'm assuming that the trail that we're talking about, the cost of which will be borne by the elementary school building committee. Uh, but it's actually on Parks and Rec's land. I think if we're more proactive with them and, and um, perhaps we could potentially share in the cost of this development of their facility as opposed to you know, it entirely coming out of our budget. For example, I think we told them at the beginning, we'll provide lights on the trail up to the property line, right. and then you guys got the lights after them. Yeah. Um, those are the kind of things that we have to square away with them before we go too crazy and, and uh, the, the costs just go crazy just because of our little connector and it's nice to go this way instead of straight through. <laughs> right. I, we just got to get those things ironed out. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Point, yeah. And I, I don't know, Jeff, if there's a way to do the timing on any of this different, but we need your guidance on that. Like if, there's, uh, if there's even a possibility of us delaying some of those decisions till later, I don't know. Well, I think it's important to get with them early to understand yeah. what their expectations are, and that way we can start to quantify what the scope is and then quantify costs and who, right. who can share and what. Because right. uh, we did carry costs for a roadway, but not necessarily all the accoutrements that Mike's mentioning and yeah. not moving the sledding hill, although that you know relatively is a smaller cost to move dirt, provided it's not hiding something, yeah. which sometimes <laughs> is how those hills <laughs> appear. <laughs> Interesting. And who, who will benefit... <coughs> more from the use of parking for each other. Won't EMC park? They will as well. I mean, because I don't think we'll need that much overflow parking, even for night activities, because there's so much parking on this site. Well, for us, I, you know, I, I agree. I don't well, no, but that, that's where I think you would, you had first started, that uh, people would park up there and walk down to the school. No, I, I was think it's going to be more in the reverse direction, yeah. which in negotiations should... Yeah, I, I was... You know, the, you know, naturally, if, if I can walk this way and go that way, or I can walk that way, every college quad in the, in the world has the diagonals paved right. because that's where the kids go. Right. It's usually the shortest distance. Oh. Right. And, and I was thinking more of mom or dad dropping off their little bundle of joy, first grade. Um, from the playground. And, and you've got to walk them down to the school. And, you know, making the distance shorter rather than longer is all I was looking at. And, and, uh, because otherwise they may park in the parking lot and cut through the playground anyway. Mm -hmm. And that may not be what we want, unless we designed it that way. Yeah, initially in the schematic design discussions we had, we talked about that driveway going right to the sidewalk that loops around the yeah. playground yeah. and just connecting to just that existing loop. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, uh, yeah. yeah, we envision it as a, as a one, one lane width roadway, you know, that 14 feet sure. that a fire truck or something could get through, not a two-lane symbiotic back and forth. It's not something where two vehicles can right. pass one. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. so those are the things we need to nail down because that could quickly spiral uh, cost if it was a two-lane road that right. had traffic going both ways. <coughs> right. But Jeffrey, to, and then I'll get to you, Pam, but what, why, um, ex remind me why you're moving towards the, towards the right for that connection so path. I, I forget where along the way but some people would mention a concern with 
putting the roadway too close to the playground and whether it could go on the other side of the, the um, sledding hill. And when I walked out there, it seemed that there was plenty of room between the existing property line of the stone wall and the other side of the sled slash community garden. But mm -hmm. to Mike's point, there may be a, a middle ground somewhere that mm -hmm. is easy to do if part of that wall is shaved off, part of that hill. Yeah, so I, I see it as like on one extreme, you go far to the right and somebody says, well, it should be a two-lane road for cars, you know, and then it gets real expensive. On the other extreme, you just do as minimal straight a line as possible to the yeah. perimeter sidewalk that already exists around the playground, and it's about, you know, 30 feet of sidewalk, pedestrian path, I would right. call it, not roadway in that case. On yeah, the, the, minimal the, the primary origins on this committee was more for pedestrians and bike trail. That's right. And right. then safety people got involved, and then there was talk about, you know, symbiotic relationships because we're encroaching on their property and how that right. could work right. out. Right. Yes, uh, clearly we need them. Uh, we need a meeting I, I, with them. I wouldn't yeah. expect this roadway to be used by the police every night uh, to check out the back of the school. They're going to do it the way they would normally yeah. do it anyway. I, I envision this as like some kind of breakaway gate or chain where the important stuff, emergency emergency vehicles, fire trucks, can get in in that case. And if that's the case, you don't really care what happens to the asphalt surface because the school's burning down. Um, so, so, but I don't envision the police on a daily basis on a normal patrol thing to access the school from that back entrance. I think it, the entrance should be more clearly for pedestrians and bicycles. Sure, they can access it in an emergency, but you know, mom with their Volvo is not going to be able to break away this chain and and, and ruin it. I think it should be somehow. I, unless I'm wrong, unless yeah, you guys or an electronic gate, yeah, right. Uh, I think I also want to reiterate. I think that the question that John was asking before, which is that in in that vision, I mean, we have okay, 75 yeah. parent parking spaces. Yeah. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't in, see parents using the EMC park piece. I, I think you're going to look at that for four or five events to happen at the school a year, back to school nights, those types of things yeah. where you could have a number of people in excess of the parking, I, I do think it's going to be more the other direction. I think it's Sundays for baseball. I think it's th those where you see it backing backing up out there. So I think um, so. I, I think that's something to consider in terms of, of that the way that path is designed and sort of how much effort we put into it is that it's, it's really not going to be day to day, I think, used by almost anybody bringing their kids to school because you think about it if you if you walk a kid from EMC Park into the, back. into the back then they've got to walk all the way around to the front entrance to get in. I mean getting my kindergarten to the bus stop in the morning takes three times as long as it should so I, I don't envision parents wanting to to do that walk um, because there is only one entrance is that right there's only one entrance right. during the there's day the drop off. Entrance. They couldn't come back. They couldn't come in through no, the back. They'd also get in the way of the bus drop off. That yeah. would be a mess. Yeah. So I think your point is, is right on. So are we discouraging people from parking it? Because when we went into town meeting, we were encouraging people, you'll be able to park at EMC Park. Not for, for, the event, for the events. For the events. For events. back to school nights. Yeah. For the things that, and again, I mean, discouraging or encouraging. There's, yeah. one, there's one entrance to the school yeah. for, for, for drop off. Right, yeah. so if you want to walk your kid from EMC Park, if you want to walk your kid from Charles View, you, yeah. you can. You, it, that's up to you, right? Yeah. But so there's no encouragement or discouragement. But yeah. I'm just saying from what I believe when you when you factor in 75 spaces for parent drop off, and you factor in what we've done with the three lanes, yeah. I don't think there's going to be a compelling reason for anybody to to do drop off by parking at EMC Park and walking their their child through. Yeah. And that's. Yeah. Encouragement or discourage? I think the only thing we're the, the only thing we're encouraging is by the parking lot size and the traffic flow in. I just I don't see on a day to day basis that EMC park being used. Yeah, it would be a matter of do we want to encourage it? And if that were the case, then we'd look at changes to what we've been talking to as the design so far. I wouldn't with, with think two we, entrances or something. I wouldn't think we want to encourage it just because again, it's that I mean you could traffic go on you Road could go example. around you could go or sort of around the other way. Um, and not disrupt the bus traffic, but y you'd have to almost like really funnel people. I, I don't. Again, I don't see. I don't see a compelling reason to encourage yeah. it. It's yeah. there if people so choose. But yeah, I see it as similar yeah. to Mike's comment about where you put sidewalks. People will find the shortest path anyway. So where you put the entrance of the building, thinking yeah. they'll know to go here. Yeah. If there's an, if they find a reason they want to park at EMC Park, they're going to walk across anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. And we want to make sure we don't make it unsafe for them to do that if they do choose to do that. Right. That's right. right, Joe. Yeah. Yep. Okay. 
beautiful. Right. And, it, and and the other by the two sexes is the use of natural materials is is uh, it is it's a pretty sight and, yeah. and we're going to have plenty of natural materials yeah so we have to do that if they yeah. use to uh, to our advantage that'd be great and also it would be a cost savings mm -hmm. yeah. Pam uh, you're over there and I don't so. see you as much but you're trying <laughs> to say something no I was just I think it's the horse is dead but the, it was <laughs> originally you know always meant as an emergency egress, this connection into EMC Park, and I think it expanded upon that. But more importantly, if you're asking Parks and Rec to come in and fund this, they have a very tight budget that's not self-sustaining in the first part, and if it's something capital related, they'd have to put an article out for this, so I think that's going to be difficult. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we want to be careful about managing costs on that side of the border. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the other things that caught my eye were the uh, use of natural materials on site. I think that's, in my opinion, that's a must, right? I think that to the extent we can do that, that's very good. Would be very well received in, in Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. Agree, disagree? Yeah. Uh, the uh, you know the colorful outdoor place spaces look great, but then you talked about having to paint acrylic paint every so many years, and then people start asking questions about where does the acrylic paint run off to, and what happens to the groundwater quality and things like that. Have you ever seen uh, that type of thing done with um, materials that are kind of I don't know what it's like stones that are already red and they stay red? It's not paint, for example, or yeah, well, um, this is, this would be asphalt paving, asphalt, yeah. yeah, because that's the most uh, durable and expensive uh, surfacing for something like a fire lane um, yeah. that's compatible also for a children's play area. Um, and uh, I think the uh, as far as the safety of acrylic acrylic paints uh, without you know just soap and water clean up with bare hands is what uh, children's paint um, with you know and it's they're they're not. Petroleum-based or you know like urethanes and they don't have VOCs and all those things that you know you're concerned about from a health um, safety standpoint. Um, the durability is is one of those things, and, and to reduce the um, the requirement for that is um, not coating everything as much, you know, um, and you end up with more painted lines on black asphalt, um, which is certainly possible, but it's not going to be quite as fun and vibrant as what we were showing you. Right. Um, oftentimes schoolyards would do their hopscotch and Foursquare and things like that, or paint the map of the United States uh, dir just directly on asphalt. You see that plenty of times. So that's that's always an option. And then repainting is just repainting those individual elements and recoding the entire surface. Okay. What we've carried in the budget, so sort of the more elaborate? Yes. Yeah, acrylic. Mm -hmm. It so, just, I mean, did, did you say you don't like that? Or? No, I just wanted to understand what it, what it meant. And then it, when you talk about the hard. Uh, I'm not sure what we carried in terms of oh. the numbers. Yeah, I thought I saw um, the the pavement the mark. We had some on our graphics. Yes, I just don't recall off the top of my head. I okay. didn't want to go on record saying it was definitely in there. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I'll clarify that. that. Sure. What exactly would be the asphalt areas? Is it where it says play area, or is it play area plus oh, the road yes. around the back side? Or point to those areas. So um, the the main lane coming through here, yeah. this paved uh, play, and going out here is all paved, and of course the driveways and parking areas. Um, these purple, or I think they're showing this kind of lavender on mm -hmm. this screen, play areas we've budgeted for ported place. Uh, rubber safety surface. Okay, good. Um, that is a um, a good placeholder to allow us to design a playground it, that uh, will work within that environment here and here. But uh, what we intend to do is scale back a little bit on the extents of that as we develop the design. Port in place. So it's a rubber surfacing yeah. that is a bonded uh, EPDM granules with a urethane yeah. that holds it all together, um, and that has a good. 12 to 15 year life expectancy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that seems, uh, you know, preferable for safety wherever mm -hmm. possible in mm -hmm. the play areas. And just a word on that safety surfacing in terms of the value and the 
um, requirements in terms of uh, there's, there's safety, the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, sets standards for that, and accessibility, ADA, sets those standards um, in terms of making sure that you have a surface that year-round, whether it's hot or cold, whether you, know, you have frost in the ground when children are out there playing, that it's going to be resilient, but it's also going to allow wheelchairs to uh, navigate on the surface. The wood fiber, sand surfaces don't allow for that. Even uh, crushed stone, like we have on the center trail, for example, which uh, wheelchairs do access. That's that's fine for trail surfaces, yeah. um, where you can get the rolling resistance uh, with a good compacted base. But for a play area and children are falling off of uh, a, yeah. a piece of equipment that might be four feet high, you have uh, the head injury criteria. Oh no 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 no! Absolutely, I want the poor. Okay. rubber stuff there yes. but where you were talking about hard asphalt mm -hmm. I'm pushing oh, to ask whether that would be any possibility of that play area that you pointed to that extends off that sidewalk right in the corner of the building there could that be crushed stone or something softer than hard asphalt the problem with those materials is that they're loose um, and you have <laughs> concerns um, I don't know specifically here in Hopkinton we can just double check but almost always we hear from safety officials when they want that plowed, they want it uh, to be a surface that is uh, not going to, that it's going to be able to be nav you know, navigate. Yeah. You can navigate with uh, fire equipment um, when, it's after it's plowed, for instance, those loose materials get displaced and you can get a road, you know, you know the uh, potholing effect and that type of thing. Um, typically, um, you know, an alternative to Asphalt might be concrete paving, but that has even more cost and it's more urban feeling. I think going to a loose fill material has issues with maintenance and plowability, uh, maybe weed growth in, in those surfaces as well. Yeah, just want to make sure the school's comfortable too. I mean, with the age of these kids and yeah. minimizing concrete and, and hard surfaces. Right, and um, they fall a lot. That's right. But <laughs> yeah. what, he, what you're describing is not concrete. No, asphalt is hard, um, <coughs> but it's no different it's like than um, running around playing on a tile floor that's got a concrete substrate yeah. to it. You wouldn't be putting play around equipment on the, no. that would no. go <laughs> on the soft surfaces. Everything, so, all of the play equipment yeah. would be in CPSI, yeah. CPSC standard you know, surfacing. And we're talking about a surface that's both compatible for play as well as for fire apparatus. So um, that's where those two material, those two demands require something that's durable like that. And uh, paved play areas is a standard practice for elementary schools. Um, and we designate them completely separate from yeah. play equipment. Okay. Okay. I, I was just going to yeah. say it's great to have that as an option um, when we can't access the field. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really nice that it's in the design yeah. um, so that we can be outside as much yeah. as possible. Yeah. The paved play would be good for other activities that aren't on the poured rubber surface, mm -hmm. at, right. at bouncing a basketball or something Anything like that. Anything other than climbing equipment. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. The, the, getting back to the painted lines and the graphics, <coughs> And, and to my mind, that, and the, the numbers and, the, and, and all that was pretty exciting and the kind of stuff I'd like to see incorporated in the school. But also, I'm, I'm mindful of, you know, the school coming back to town meeting every seven years to repaint all that stuff. And it's going to get pretty old after the first couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to try to avoid those kind of things, something that would last a little bit longer. And so, so it's not the school comes back and says it's looking pretty shabby. We need another, yeah. you know, fifty grand to repaint it. Well, and then those it becomes be a town meeting article, and it becomes a the, it becomes the solar panels all over. Well, that's a question too. At least from that standpoint, is is are we are we talking about from a maintenance resurfacing perspective? Are we talking about something that is a capital article level, you know, twenty five fifty thousand dollars when you have to do it, or are we talking about something that fits into an operating maintenance budget? Well, I know some communities will put uh, resurfacing together with when they're, you know, resurfacing their basketball or tennis courts. Mm -hmm. One company can come in and do that as as one package. Um, well, but for instance, what does it cost to resurface a basketball court? You know, well, we just, that, one, that one we're familiar <laughs> with because we just did that. I just didn't. <laughs> Thirty-two thousand. Yeah, I was gonna say it's not. It's not, a, it's, we, yeah, it's not a. It's not a light cost. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the yeah, 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 big, bigger four, area four, than this. Four tennis just courts. Just four tennis courts and the basketball. Two basketball. Oh, two basketball. Much bigger area than this. Much bigger area than this. Yeah. Yeah. 
and maybe yeah. it's important to hit the paint the whole thing. So, yeah. right. I mean, your your yeah. risk of the wear and tear here is it's a, it's the fire lane road. So in the winter it'll, it'll be right. plowed, and that's what's going to you know, scrape the paint and mm -hmm. prematurely wear yeah. it out. You yeah. know, it's so not the twice a day when a cruiser drives across it. It's, it's the right. plowing that'll chip away at it. And and I'm happy scaling back to wherever you're comfortable. Um, it's just going to be harder harder to disguise a fire lane as a play area if we don't do some mm -hmm. sort of coating. So yeah. we might um, just focus on the knuckle where it all comes together there, perhaps. Maybe that's a, a happy medium instead of stretching this, this out. But this space down in here maybe is something that we can do. I don't think I'm, yeah, I'm not hearing yeah. people push you in that direction. Okay. Okay. You know, I mean, I think that we like the idea, as Mike said, of mm -hmm. like making it look fun, mm -hmm. you know, okay. disguising it. Yeah. That's okay. the whole point of this part. And I yeah. think, yep. like what your you? point on uh, HVAC and checking the systems, I mean, we are doing this for the younger people, and that's as important as energy conservation, so it needs to be worked into the operating budget. Right. I agree. Okay. Thanks for the question. And you won't be here 14 years from now. Yeah, I'll be here. <laughs> I won't be on this committee. Well, you won't be on this committee. I'll be on another committee. You'll building. be on the, the, next, the next building. <laughs> I'll be the real old guy that. <laughs> one cycle yeah. won't be a problem. Yeah, thanks, David. It was so excellent. I, I mean, just to clarify, I heard the general. You like the general direction of what Dave's yeah. going. Yes. Yeah. 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 But yeah, definitely. Some of the things you were good at were providing options, so it's hard to see like the direction. If you're saying it could be this or that. Yeah. But I think on one of those was, um, you know, you want a modern, contemporary look or a natural look. Mm -hmm. and I, th I think what I'm hearing is around the, the site to incorporate as much natural. Material as possible. We're not looking for a ultra modern looking. I don't site think the Gabbians were well received. Okay. Those containers of rocks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. they look cool, but probably would be out of sync with the yeah. rest of the site yeah. as we envision it. But mm. I would like to see if, if we do go with something with the acrylic, is the cost of the expected life and the cost to replace that? Because you're okay. right, the snow piles are going to go through, and you might have to replace it after two instead of five. <coughs> Just because it's not going to be, you know, just the weather that's doing it, but also machinery. So it could be replaced more frequently than the tennis courts. The basketball well, much courts. more, because yeah. when were the yeah. tennis, courts tennis courts last yeah. done? They were well long ago, more than, much more yeah. than five or seven years. Yeah, they, they do last. There are uh, coatings that are used in streets that are a little bit more expensive. What we can do is come back to you and show you the uh, acrylic coating, life expectancy, replacement cost associated with that as compared to the street coatings that are used more at the intersections uh, of roadways and just to show you what the premium might be for that, that maybe you, well, you wouldn't have to recoat it as often. So mm -hmm. um, that would be a good comparison to, to make. Yeah, with along with the square footage that this is because it's relatively small. So you you would be developing these are just thoughts you presented tonight, David. So yes. you'll be developing the look of this and the sort of actual thing to bring back to the committee yeah. when. I um, mean, like just roughly. I mean, like uh, I'm thinking maybe when we present the exterior elevations. Okay. So it, maybe those two can kind of tie in together. And I think that's the meeting in January. Okay. Go ahead. If I remember correctly. January. Yeah, January twentieth. January twentieth. Thanks. What? When we're talking uh, acrylic coatings and, and all that, I assume that's going to render whatever surface we put that on is impervious. You have to start with impervious in order for the acrylic coating to work properly. So, so you have to really work with that person to your right <laughs> because she's trying to make this all pervious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you two guys got to work together to right. make that work out because, you know, we can't have it one way or the other. No, so I know we we do uh, collaborate very okay. closely together yeah. and. Uh, you know, porous asphalt is not a good idea for a children's play area anyway right. because it's very um, grainy, yeah. uh, rough texture. Sure. Yeah. We don't want to follow that. <laughs> so it, it's got to, whether it's coated or not, it's going to yeah. be impervious. Okay. Great. Okay. Anything else? Anything else on this topic? Okay. So do, do you need input more frequently than? we currently have meetings scheduled on the site I don't, development? I don't like believe so, no. Yeah. Um, I think that January 20th is a good uh, date now for us to be fully coordinated and prepared for. And I believe there's also a subcommittee meeting planned, if I'm mm -hmm. correct, on playground and outdoor areas. 
So um, Which I think is the following meeting, the 27th. I think. So no, I think that will work out well for us. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a it's an interesting site, right? I mean, into the wetlands yeah, there, and it, there's people who is is this this the headwaters of the Charles River here? Is that what people say, Mike? That's what everybody says. Right? Yeah, I mean, so flows across uh, Haven Road Street yeah. and then to the south. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, say that again. Uh, the water from the site flows across, most of it anyway, flows yeah. across Hayden Road Street and to the south. The wetland area that you can see highlighted in the blue here um, is, uh, it basically continues off. There's the whole uh, watershed from the high school, middle school, and high yeah. school that all comes down yeah. this way, too. And I'm assuming um, that it would also go up into EMC Park, that wetlands area. I think yes. there's a reason that that's all green. Oh, yeah. sure. Yes. Yeah. This oh, yeah, is, yeah. This is the part that was delineated by the survey for this project. Yeah. yeah. So that's all we're showing. But yes, indeed, I'm sure that's wetlands. Right. Yeah, I guess my th thought process here is that, you know, you talked about using, you know, m material on site as much as possible. And I think that hits a chord with me because I hear a lot of concern about this is that the headwater, uh, part of the headwaters of the Charles River, right? And Hopkinton, the place where we have the marathon, mm -hmm. and it all starts here from here to Boston. And the Charles River goes from here to Boston. And um, I think the more we can do to kind of accentuate the the ecological heritage of the site would be very well received by the community. It's a part of the innovation, right? Correct. <laughs> Rain gardens that are contributing yeah. you know, to the headwaters. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And please, you know, reach out during the process if you need input from the full committee or any portion of it. And we will, we have the action to connect to you as soon as possible with Parks and Rec or the multi site committee or whatever the right venue is. Mike? Are we all done with utilities? I think so. No, I, I think, think, I think there's we'd more like on that. Quick utility. Quick okay, now the utility, yeah. Well, we've talked about the stormwater a lot already. The um, plan is to have uh, a, a series of, of smaller, very shallow surface basins integrated into the landscape. Uh, they're designed to drain out very quickly so that they um, don't have standing water in it other than that it's raining. Um, we're looking to do some, like some of the other images that David showed that we've done on other projects, maybe a, a meadow type area or um, integrated into the hardscape too. We, we can do different kinds of rainwater management areas, different kinds of swales. We have a swale coming down the edge of the road here. Um, we can't do it on both sides because of the sidewalk we need to get the safer to the school, up to the school. But um, as much as we can, we'd like to deal with the water on the surface, let it naturally soak into the ground, reduce impervious area as best we can to put more infiltration. Um, in some of the areas where we're filling the grade, we might be able to put some pipes underneath the parking lot. Like I mentioned before, this is a, um, the soils here are not very permeable, and so we are going to need quite a bit of storage to control the water leaving the site, but it will all be designed to meet or exceed stormwater management standards to reduce pollutants, especially for Charles River, TMDO has um, its own requirements attached to it. And going through the wetlands too, we'll need to work closely with the Conservation Commission to make sure that we're properly treating the stormwater. The other utilities on site haven't really changed since you've seen them. We have a utility corridor coming up the road from Hayden Road Street. We've been working with DPW to start the permitting process of that. We're going to um, be submitting preliminary letters to start that approval process in the next coming weeks, at least by January. Um, and we also included in the schematic design the um, intersection improvements that uh, we had talked about, some of the recommendations we had of the turning lanes and traffic signals to be timed during peak hours for the school. There are really only one or two cars expected to queue in Hayden Row, but we, um, we do have the turn lane to make sure we're not mm -hmm. making any traffic worse in this area. Um, Does everybody on the committee understand what's happening at Hayden Row? Uh, no, I mean, actually, it's the first time I've heard about the potential for cars backing up onto Hayden Row, I think, mm -hmm. uh, unless it was as part of a turning lane that's off the road. Jim? I think, um, <clears throat> to be clear, in terms yeah. of cars backing up on Hayden Road, I, I think what Chelsea is indicating, 
There is minimal. This uh, one car. It was stated uh, at the my gosh uh, the meeting several months back that it's only a a car car and one at the worst, and right. it's typically a vehicle at which the worst. Is right. Very very low. And only in the for a matter of like seconds or a minute or something. That given the worst case scenario, yeah. there might it, be one car waiting to yeah, turn in. The turn worst in. case scenario. And, and in the worst case scenario, that, that doesn't become an obstacle for through traffic on Hayden. Not Marine. at all because we have because we got the turning, got the turning lane. lane. Correct. You've got turning yeah. lanes okay. going yeah. north yeah. and south. Correct. One other. Time. Do you have the image? Yeah. Well, yeah. Let's we take really the to zoom to in on that. <coughs> <coughs> we, there, okay. <coughs> you don't need if you're talking about on Hayden Row itself. You wouldn't need a turning lane on Hayden Row coming north, north because you would just turn it. You would make that move, right. yeah. It's a, it's a and right. Right. The, the, the queue so line there the is, issue. Dave, you know roughly the linear footage of from the start of the driveway <coughs> to the parent drop off? So we have two lanes coming out of the driveway, yeah. and then we have a straight route through and one turning lane going left into the driveway. Where's the car that's hanging out in the street? Okay, so that's in the turning lane. Mm -hmm. So right. we don't have a car coming from. You don't have somebody coming back up from up here corner. preventing people. It won't be people right. queuing. In right. that. You have you have a car that's in the turning lane that's got to wait for an opening to turn yeah. left, but not flocking through traffic coming south on 85. Okay. So the through traffic goes straight through. Both but north the, and the south. The impact is basically at those cut lines, right? Because you're going to start the process that far back. To yeah. funnel people. I'm just yeah, you can actually see it here. Is there any paving improvements along? Is that has it's to be so some paving improvements? Yeah, so yeah. Everything's yeah. still under the car yeah. from the north. It's a yeah. 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 You can just keep going if you stay in the right lane. Right. 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 Because it goes into wetlands to some extent. It's um, in the buffer. The whole entrance is in the buffer zone. Right. And so it'll all just be reviewed together. Okay. Right. There is a widening of. Right. Because I mean, point. I've walked 85 at that point, and it doesn't look like you can add a lane in there. So you do have to eat into do you have any the the Irvine right? property or our property. Yes. Okay. Yes. To create that additional space. Right. Which also limits how far back you can actually start that to on either end. Right. Is there a turning lane uh, if you're headed uh, north? Is there a turning no, lane? There is no, there's not. It's yeah, but and there's but nothing impeding that right turn. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's nothing impeding that right turn. Yeah. You don't anticipate a car being backed up there, yeah. even yeah. under worst yeah. case scenario. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is there another layer of traffic study and analysis that has to happen now, or was that traffic study we I didn't did? Think so. I thought we were Just the further design of the yeah. signal plan itself. Design of the signal plan itself. Okay. Like, yeah. like timing and things. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's another connection point with the selectman, Mike, is to make sure, you know, the people are concerned about Hayden Road traffic overall, overall. like the existing situation further north. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> they, uh, I want to make sure everybody's clear that we've provided the traffic study to the town and to the DPW already yeah. and there's nothing stopping them from going ahead and addressing other stuff that's outside the purview of our traffic impact. One of our recommendations in the study was also to do a lane up by the high school for for the traffic issues up there because we did analyze that intersection as well. You analyzed that and made that recommendation but not as an impact of our project, Not as right? Part of yeah. this project. Right. No, but but well, we appreciated we that you looked at that anyway. So right. Yeah. Yeah. We did document that. Yes, yeah, so we've already done some of the work for them. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it's also what they came up with a couple of years ago at town meeting. And so it reinforces it. Uh, I was going to say, you can <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> stand there. <laughs> Just coming out of the yes. chamber when it's tough. At what point do we sit down with DBW and discuss sidewalks and whatever improvements we have to do in terms of whether we have a sidewalk on the east side of Hayden Road Street, which right. we suspect we'll want, um, and what if any modifications we'll have to do on the sidewalk on the on the western side because of the street improvements? Because the right. the DPW and the selectmen got together and said we'll take care of the sidewalks. Well, there are sidewalks on the yeah. the west, yeah. right already. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's about the improvements, I see. You know, we're talking, yeah. you know, a school is not going to be occupied for over two years, so I'm just thinking now would be the time where the DPW and selectmen go in the queue. Absolutely. Where it could be budgeted. Yeah. This is the cyber. Now is the time. But it has to be done 
not in a vacuum, but with our plan. Yeah, That's so true. if we left to our own devices, we have budget to, in, is it part of our plan to have sidewalk on that portion of Hayden Row? Or any, did we put sidewalk on no, Hayden Row at all? Walk over. Just, there's a crosswalk. Yeah, we talked about off-site yeah. sidewalks. Right. So I know we had some informal discussions with the uh, director of Lanny's and planning, and she indicated that, yeah, that stretch from uh, your driveway to EMC Park is in the queue as one of the next priorities. Yeah. So on we the, need to activate on the, that. On the opposite side of the street? Uh, our, no, is it, there already is a sidewalk on the opposite side. On our side. Uh, but we would want, I think the town would want one from EMC Park driveway to here. So we should, that's another action for me to take um, with, with, the, with backup from you guys on timing of when, mm -hmm. when they should yeah, be planning sounds, to do that. Yeah, my whole point is we don't want to spring it on them two years from now. And, uh, no, it's something we that thought you guys were taking care of the sidewalk, and, and, and you know, I'd rather say that now. Yeah, you guys are taking care of the sidewalk. I mean, with the with the Adeline, you know, turning lane, you know, and the wetlands that exist there, tight. Leaving, yeah, it's very tight to add a sidewalk there. So, making sure we appropriate space for that and balance the you know, yeah. three travel lanes as well as the sidewalk, yeah. and not encroach too far into the wetlands is something yeah. we'll need to look at. Yeah, what yeah. would be the benefit of the sidewalk on that side, up to the EMC driveway? Uh, you'd have to talk to the director of land use and planning, but I believe it's that, uh, and maybe it falls in the purview of this multi-site development committee too, but there already is a sidewalk all the way to EMC Park, and then it stops. Okay. And now we're developing the site. Okay. So So coming north to south, there's already one there. Yeah, there's a sidewalk all the way from the center of town to the EMC Park driveway as you're headed south, and then it stops they on the other side. I'm driving by it every day, I don't yeah. see it. <laughs> So, okay. Um, I mean, to, to, but building on Mike's point, I mean, one of the other meetings that uh, Judd and the design team will be scheduling with us as well is with the permitting review authority. So we've had a few already uh, at multiple times during schematic design where we met with the DPW, a town engineer, town planner, CONCOM, and we're going to meet with them again <coughs> next month at some yeah. point. So we have to schedule that meeting and, you know, we'll flush out more of these uh, finer details. We talked about the higher level stuff at schematic and now we're going to uh, get more to the nitty gritty. That'll be part of the site plan review process anyways, right? I'm sure. Right, but full site plan review doesn't yeah. happen until later, so this is to make sure yeah. we're lined up for the hiccups. And come. didn't we budget uh, in schematic for uh, uh, traffic signalization yeah. as well? Yes. Oh, and and that's yeah, part of no, what you're showing you there? You do see on the plan there, they do show some of the signaling on it. Okay. What was included in, so it was think there was an allowance we carried for that, Jeff, if I remember correctly. Right, we carried an allowance. So the, what's shown there on that uh, black and white board that Joe, Judd had held up in Chelsea there, the limit of those black lines is what we've carried outside of the property, yeah. and it does need further development from, from the allowance. So there may be some adds or minuses compared to what we carried because it wasn't detailed uh, at that level right. when we had schematic. Yeah, it would, it would probably be some time lighting, right, where... Uh, yeah. It's active during school, start and finish, but then it's flashing off or yeah. flashing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, along the lines of, of utilities, has, has anybody reached out to Eversource to be able to tell us that they have adequate electricity to run this school and or gas? So I talked to the electrical engineer today. They're putting together that what they typically do is a load letter. Yeah. So they put together a load of what the anticipated load that they expect for that, and then they'll and they'll it tell on. us whether or not there's. So they'll forward that onto them and say, because you know, we want to. What I'm getting at is, I'm, I'm sure power-wise, it's it's not an issue, but you know, because it, the worst case scenario is run some more wires and put on a few more transformers. But gas and tearing up Hayden Road Street to put in a bigger gas main because the school is going to draw just put us over the limit. The yeah. gas company needs two years to figure out how to do that. So that's something we got to do right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, we don't want to not have gas when we go to open the school. Yeah. Do we have the load letter yet, or is it? Was that? Would there be a load letter at this point, or does he need more design time? No, I think right now the design's pretty well developed. Yeah. He can come up with some, you know. Yeah. But I think he can be in the ballpark right. for what he needs. Yeah, yeah, need, we, we need to. And I bet you he estimates. If he's got the load letter, we should probably get it. They're they're generating it right now. I just rather get it now than later. Didn't mm -hmm. we also speak about making sure we had 
additional capacity once the so that you don't have to tear everything up to put the southern whatever happens in the south in there as well yeah. when we talk about utilities yes. under the driveway entrance driveway in your conversations with DPW we're still on that track right where we're doing wider and more than we need to just for the school in terms of the amount of whatever going through yeah I think uh, my understanding was is what we're going to do is is we we're going to put stuff underneath this access roadway so that when and if they put for example a hockey rink on the undeveloped site we don't have to tear up the roadway again to accommodate the hockey rink that was the uh, whether mechanically or engineering wise is a way to do that so it would be a smart that would be smart money spent at this time rather than have to do it over again that's all so that that was the discussion, but how how do you do that if you don't know what the what if you the, don't know what the <laughs> is, you know. can they run some spare lines? Yeah, you, just you probably have to. I mean, run, you run more probably start a probably similar have size facility conduit conduit there, and you what, say whatever the load is for this building, we could a duplicate facility. Yeah, there. I mean, start right. right. the dialogue Estimate. at that level. Yeah. Yeah. but I, I think that's almost you know I, I see that on, on most designs you know there's a you know the duck bank or so that they yeah. say coming into the site there's usually all right. These lines are going to have this, and they're going to have four spare lines that are just going to be open, and they're going to be open for future uses. Yeah, the duct bank is easy. I'm talking about gas, yeah, right. gas or pipe and drains, and yeah. So that's a request. We want to make sure you continue that vein yep. of thought yeah, it's on as we, as as we engage with ever source. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think you know we, the discussion when we had it would revolve around surge and capacity. We, we know what's coming out of the school and going down that road. But of course, we don't know what's coming from the other part and going down that road. But we just want to make sure that we had potentially enough capacity for it. And I can't remember, but does the southern edge touch the Tadero site? It does. Yes. yes. Yeah, so that, that really should be part of the planning as well as which way they, those yeah. utilities might come in, yeah. not necessarily burdening this project. Yeah. No, that's true, too. Do we need, I mean, presuming there's a committee set up on the multi-use, we just have a joint meeting with them or, or what, you know? I guess let's, let's figure out if there is one in existence yet, because Pam, you're, you're not sure if they actually got appointed. I think they might be expanding it. Okay. I know there are people that have been appointed already. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we may end up needing just liaison representative yeah to that absolutely yeah. yeah we need somebody from their Probably, committee yeah. we might need somebody from their committee here too or maybe there already right. is somebody on our committee appointed there too I don't know um, I don't know if John is okay there's a school representative it's on not me it. yeah but there is a school <laughs> yeah <laughs> right. without yeah exactly yeah <laughs> okay <coughs> All right, I think that that's. Do you ha need anything else from us? Um, no, this was good feedback from me. Yeah. Okay. So, where do we want to go next, Jeff? To, uh, uh, so, that, that's actually kind of a site discussion. So, we want to give you an update on where the educational user group meetings have progressed. So, um, we've had one educational user group meeting to date um, uh, since our last meeting. At that meeting, we focused in on the admin suite itself off the main lobby and how the configuration of the principal reception conference space all work and then across the hall for the nurses suite the uh, work room for teachers and the custodial storage and a couple of configurations there and I'll let uh, Judd update you on what was discussed at those meetings. Sure so um, as Jeff had indicated we looked at this area right here this area um, shown in pink here which is the main administration area and then across the hall there was some um, a teacher's work room and a duplicating room and then the nurse's suite um, and then we also looked at the back area here regarding the custodial and the maintenance um, office and, and work room um, and again just so everybody understands this is kind of an updated um, uh, user uh, group meeting schedule um, we usually look at this just about every week and, and make some slight revisions to it, but this I think is is basically the final one. And as Jeff has indicated, we've we've done this one here. Um, the, the the last one was actually the lead workshop, and this Wednesday we're looking at typical classrooms, primarily the 
you know, your pre-K, your kindergarten classrooms, which are um, similar in, in layout with some slight tweaks to them, and then your first grade classrooms. And then the other thing they want us to look at is um, bathrooms and bathroom locations in reference to those areas. So that's, that's this, um, this Wednesday. So in terms of the ones that we've looked at, so this was some, some, and primarily what we wanted to do is just go back and look at the layouts and provide some alternative layouts that either some, some suggestions that we had for a layout that might work a little bit better, may have some better adjacencies with it. And the two sketches that we had done uh, here, A and B, uh, and primarily what it, it looked at was um, we had a, in the original plan, and this somewhat follows somewhat of the original plan, it had the conference room. The main lobby is right here. So this is your main, this is the main entrance point. You actually enter into the, the main lobby here. These doors would be locked. Mm -hmm. So you have to get into the admin, admin suite, kind of get um, registered in, get badged if you need to be badged, and then you can get released into the school proper. Um, but primarily, the, 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 the two differences in the layout is, is in this area here that was the, the, the conference room. And we were trying, in the original plan, it was a little thinner, longer. Um, and we tried to make it a little bit bigger so we could get a, 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 as many people as we can in, in, in kind of that area. And this one was showing we could probably get about 12 in that conference room. Uh, the only difference that we looked at in B is basically swapping the um, conference room with the assistant principal's office. And that was kind of seen as a plus. What they wanted is basically even to having the assistant principal having a door directly off of the lobby area. Um, so that was kind of seen as, as the benefit to this plan. Um, and this is kind of the finalized plan that we worked out with the furniture in it. So again, you'd enter into a general office area. We'd have some waiting chairs here. Um, there'd be a general office person, principal secretary in this area, access to, again, principal, uh, assistant principal office here, desk, small four-person conference table, some bookcases, some files. Uh, and each of the offices, too, we're looking at putting in, you know, hopefully a, maybe a short throw projector or some sort of pr projecting device, um, whether a smart board or even a, a whiteboard. Um, we'd also develop a small little workroom in this area here. This would house the mailbox assemblies for the teachers. There'd be a sink and a small work table and another copier area. Um, this was also seen as a benefit because there's a lot of visitors who come to the school for um, maybe an hour or two, but they need a place to work and they don't have an office area. So there'd be a couple of desks generated here that people could come, plug in, do some work that they had to go do whatever uh, meetings they'd have to meet with or uh, uh, groups that they'd have to do uh, work with. Uh, but it would give them a spot to kind of connect in. Um, there's a principal's office down in here, a little bit of a larger conference room here. We get about a six-person table in that area there as well. Uh, a staff toilet directly off of the admin area. And then these two areas, this is a network room. It's pretty much the head end room uh, for the school. And then there's a, an electric closet, an emergency closet, both of these kind of off the corridor area. <clears throat> And Joe, talk about the uh, storage, how we looked at that. And oh, yeah. So, that. yeah, so the, yeah and, and we had some discussions, too, with the MSBA because we're making some changes to the educational program in terms of the area. The admin hasn't changed in terms of the square footage. It's just being re reallocated slightly to, 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 to meet the needs better. Yeah. One of the things we looked at, we had a, a much larger record storage room, and it had, I think, almost 15 or 18 uh, lateral files and we knew we didn't need that many um, so we, we were able to kind of shorten that up and that kind of helped again get us a little bit of a larger conference room which was always a need because it's the only con con conference room they're going to have in the facility yep. um, so that was definitely seen as um, given that a benefit. this is their first school we don't they don't have large records yeah, right? right. <laughs> so they're only beginning to gather them right. and, uh, and and more and more so records are, are becoming electronic as, as time goes by as well so that was a really nice savings mm. of space yeah so that was that area. And then the next one is kind of across the hall. So we looked at a couple of different options again here as well. Uh, this option one was primarily the layout that we had in the schematic design submission. Um, one of the things we kind of, we did like about it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a weird space in terms of its shape. Um, so it, it has kind of, we wanted to try to get this entrance off again. Here's the main lobby area to give it some sort of presence, uh, presence on the main lobby area. Um, 
So th this is roughly what we had carried in here. Again, the elevator we're looking at right now is a, is a machineless um, elevator, um, machineless room elevator, so it doesn't actually need um, a machine room, which we had there, so we were able to get a slightly larger custodial closet in that area. Uh, the second option that we looked at was primarily trying to square the area up here, make it uh, its layout a little, slightly better. This area here is a little bit better. This gets a little tight in this, you know, this is a little bit more rectilinear. This was a little bit more square. Uh, again, having a toilet off of there. Again, we would get a slightly larger um, custodial closet, um, but this was somewhat of the same layout for teacher's workroom and the duplicating room. The third option um, looked at kind of switching the office, the nurse's office with the teacher's workroom, getting the teacher's workroom kind of back. Um, you know, its entrance is kind of off of the stair, but still having the nurse's area be kind of mostly off of the main uh, lobby area. Um, again, it would have, a, again, a toilet and exam room. It, the thing that wasn't so great about this is we needed to get a third resting room in there, which is what they had now. And if the nurse is here in the exam room, there's really no supervision over the office area. So I was kind of seeing some of the negatives of that. So we went back and looked at a couple of uh, different options for that. One of the other things that we did come up with here is um, we've gotten rid of the duplicating room. We're going to take that square footage and incorporate it as part of the teacher's workroom. So it'll be a teacher's workroom that'll have some workstations for them and there will be a copier in it. But we didn't really see the need for a separate room for it. So that kind of opened that up a little bit. So this plan looked at it more um, running kind of, um, I believe that's north-south. Uh, again, nurse's office here, work table, toilet and exam room, and uh, a, a more rectilinear teacher's work room um, with some storage and some copiers along that area. The second plan kind of, again, swapped the, the teacher's work room back in this area and again made a little bit of it. We were able to get our, our three cots in here, toilet and exam room, and a, a kind of a nicer um, office area here for the nurse. Uh, the other b benefit it did is it gave us a, m a more significant custodial storage room, which in the plan it's somewhat lacking. Um, I don't know if you guys remember when we made the MSBA submission, the square footage of custodial was really under what the regulations for the MSBA would allow. Um, so we're really trying to get space back for them. So that, that was really seen as a benefit. And that was kind of the scheme that, that we talked about um, as being a preference, and um, this is kind of um, the worked out um, area for it with the equipment in it. Um, so we haven't really had a chance to share these yet with the group because we, we were going to do it at the beginning of the lead meeting, but we're going to push that off till Wednesday. But I did get some, um, some um, preliminary feedback, both from Lauren, I believe, in terms of the, the layouts, and I think, Kathy, you had two in terms of that. So. These are the directions we're heading. That's typically how the user group meetings go. We, we, we like them to be more of a working group, so we come in with some options. We have a lot of discussion. Yeah. We make some modifications, and then we come back and make a, a kind of a revised presentation and hopefully you know, get a sign-off on it. I see. So that was that one. And the last one was the custodial um, office <coughs> area. And the main thing that we did here is we just got rid of this corridor that was here. There really was no need for it. Um, we can actually enter. The, the, we didn't have to enter the main electric room directly off the corridor. We could do it off of the mechanical room. The only thing our electrical engineer said is that door, all doors in electrical rooms have to swing out. So it just didn't have to swing out into the space. The one thing, though, it does do is it does make the gym storage slightly smaller than what we had originally. But that was a space that the MSBA had kind of said it, they didn't, in terms of the square footage that we had originally had in here, they basically said you should just try to get whatever square footage you can within your grossing factor. That they didn't really want to approve a higher number than what they had said the typical school would get. But again, this is basically about a, I think a 50 square foot reduction. It goes from about 325 square feet to about 275 square feet. We still think we can get you know a significant number of um, metal storage units here. But it does really make a much, uh, a, a much a bigger and more usable custodial office and really make it a workroom. That's one of the things we talked about. There are some work tables in here and things of that nature. So this is kind of the final plan that was, that was worked up. There'd be some uh, lots of metal storage cabinets. There'd be some areas for pallet storage so they could bring pallets of paper in and kind of let them sit there. There'd be some work tables um, in this area here. 
it just basically a desk with some files and some flat files, another thing that they had wanted. But again, we were able to give a little bit more square footage. And with those kind of changes that we've made to the custodial area, we're really right on track with what the MSBA square footage is say the building should I just have. Will add so that I think it's important to note that we don't have a workshop anywhere in the district. So to have a custodial workshop benefits us across the whole district. We can do repairs in that workshop that are needed at, at other buildings. Um, so working working with with Judd and, and the group, um, as we were able to look at that, it, it seemed like something that, that was exciting because it could benefit yeah. our other buildings as well. What, what are some examples of things that would happen in the custodial office and workshop? Repairs. Like small, small repairs, you know. So he would have equipment to be able to repair drawers or bring bring things from other district uh, other buildings i've seen things that are lying around in their um chairs that have come off of their yeah. you know their rollers and okay. different things like that that yeah. break um but nowhere to actually do the work so people that are able to do the work but just not the equipment or a space to be able to do it right um you know he has an electric saw to do i don't know Al should be here. Well, Al, Al, did, yeah. Al did have a number of examples. <laughs> definitely, when we, yeah. When we were going over, oh, yeah. I was there, yeah, when that was yeah. being reviewed. Yeah, I forget. He had a whole right. bunch of things he was talking Yeah. <laughs> Not just <coughs> pertaining to this school building, but the right. district. Just overall. in general, Which the district. Which is a great question, right? Because yeah, yeah. it's a brand new building. We're not yeah, hoping yeah. to have a lot of repairs. But <laughs> to, to, to have something that benefits the district. And, and plans ahead so that there's space. Yeah, I mean, and how do you feel about the compromise on the gym storage? I mean, is that still, Yeah. That, I mean. Are you asking me? Yes, um, yeah. I'm not concerned about that. I feel like it would, there was plenty. Um, there's also space always within the gym for storage that doesn't have to necessarily be in a, in a tucked away closet. Right. I think um, and you can have the hanging storage spaces too for yeah. balls, et cetera, if yeah. you're short on space. Okay. Yeah. I think, Right now, that size, and it's saying 295. It's about what there is now. And the room that they have is basically the way that it's set up. There's some metal shelvings around the ring, and then there are different bins they can bring in in the open area for different things. So, I, you know, at least from what they have now, um, if that's what we're looking to store in there, that should be sufficient. Does the main electric we'll room need to be that big, or, or is yeah. it? Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah. There is a layout for everything that's in there. There's transformers and panels that need. Then, and then there's really, I was going to say, if it wasn't that case, you could move that gym storage wall and just have the entrance to it off of the custodial workshop. But if it needs that space, that's what's pinching the, custod the gym storage. Right. Is that something you looked at? Or we did. As a matter of fact, the emergency electric room was off of the boiler room in the original plan. We've now moved that into the electric room, which again, has some impacts for the panel layouts that they have. I think if you look at the previous plan, I thought I drew those in. Yeah, so you have to see all the panels that are along the wall. And they all have different requirements. There's different clearances you need around them and things of that nature in case somebody's working in front of them and there's a, an explosion, so. And in terms of the boiler room size, I mean, that's, that's a pretty good boiler room size, too. I know that we've done some preliminary layouts in there. Um, and, and in terms of what they need, the space allocated to that is sufficient for it. Just, just my two cents. I, I don't think you can, you can minimize the custodial space because the school doesn't have two things. It doesn't have an attic and it doesn't have a basement. So there are things that custodians deal with every day when tiles get stained or whatever. They have extra tiles. They have extra. They have extras of everything, all of which takes space. Mm -hmm. And uh, what looks like a big space is going to come really small really fast. Okay. Yeah. And uh, this is slightly smaller than a typical yeah. classroom right now. This is about your t your first grade classrooms are around 900, 950 square feet. And this is I think around 725, 750. Okay. That's it for the, the recap yep. of the first uh, user group, educational user group meeting. Okay. Yeah, sounds like uh, those are going well. Um, and I agree, like this small working group, in that case especially, like Kathy and Lauren and Al were the right people. As other topics come in, like lead, uh, you saw additional people show up because they're interested. 
So I just want to make sure we keep uh, publishing the topics well, you know, like a week ahead or whatever. Yeah, so we yeah I can I distribute saw that, agenda, uh, that agenda. Of the, the list of meeting yeah. dates and topics. And, um, yeah, that would be great. And if we uh, post those as ESBC meetings, anybody could show up. I would anticipate. Anybody could show up anyway. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're welcome. So the, it's always Wednesdays at 1 o'clock um, in Kathy's conference room. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll email out the schedule. Uh, anybody's welcome to join us for those meetings. It's during the day because we're bringing in all the department heads. So the various, uh, it's not directors. What's the term you use for the? Yeah, the, the, the subject matter leaders. Yeah, subject Correct. matter. Thank you. Yeah. Subject matter leaders. So whether it's nurse or the gym teachers mm -hmm. or health or art mm -hmm. and music, um, those are the people we bring in during the day to solicit their feedback. And, you know, they have coverage or we work it around their schedules. Good. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Thank you. So um, that was what we had for the agenda. Our next meeting is uh, January 20th of, of this group. Um, what will happen in between now and then, um, back to the CM selection process, is those proposals are due back, um, as Tim noted, at the end of this week. And then the subcommittee will review those. We'll shortlist it down to four. And those proposals then will come back um, in January. And so at your next meeting, we'll have a list of the, of the proposals that came back in, but we won't have had the interviews yet to bring a recommendation to this committee about who the preferred CM will be. Um, but that will happen for your February 8th meeting where we would come back, we'll have interviewed the four, and finalize the recommendation from that committee as who should be the CM. Okay, good. <clears throat> I think that's, uh, is there any, any other topics people wanted to cover or any other questions for us? Get it all right, okay. So at your next meeting, the main topics will be the exterior elevation, so the, the skin of the building, what it looks like. David's going to bring an update on the site layout and, you know, incorporating some of what you saw today. And then we'll also talk about, you know, security in terms of a response to the building and, and how the building gets locked down in terms of access. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Probably that's going to be a pretty quick long meeting. meeting. Yeah. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thanks everybody. <laughs>